verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Now, you notice it's interesting, verse 14, they are, so these unclean spirits, these devils, they're also called, they are the what? Spirits of devils. See that? It's like they came from devils themselves. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? This is all a spiritual plane, you got to understand. They are the spirits of devils. So it kind of makes sense that the spirit is formed from something. It's from something. Verse 14, working miracles. Now look at that. These demonic spirits, they work miracles. So this is the problem with a lot of people that I want people to pay attention really well. And I get a lot of hate on this online and even from people who are avid fans of me. Because this is something that's very, very dangerous that you people have gotten very cling, uh, clunged on to. And despite of how hard I work to build up subscribers, me, I'm not going to compromise by you know, not teaching something where I lose subscribers. Amen. If you came to this channel, you subscribe to this channel because you want to hear somebody telling you the truth. Amen. So I'm not going to let you down on that. So even if it's unpopular or it hurts your feeling, I'm going to say it because you entrusted me with that. And God's going to hold me accountable for that. So I have to tell you the truth. So here's the thing. A lot of people, they get involved with this charismatic healing, signs, wonders, and visions. And then when you show them scripture, what's wrong with that? They get very emotional on you. And they get very angry at you. And these people, no matter how much scripture you use, they keep using their experience to say, well, I can't understand, I can't understand. You know why you can't understand? That's your flesh. You're going by the feelings of your flesh. Your flesh is having a hard time understanding. Look, it's not a matter of how your flesh can grasp it. It's what does the book say? If the word says it, you just believe it by faith. It's that simple. So here's the thing. Your pastor does not deny miracles. We believe in the power of prayer, and God can still heal people today. Thank God for that. Amen? Otherwise, we would, even, we would not even waste time praying if we don't believe in a God that works miracles. But here's the thing, what we deny, we don't deny the healer. What we deny is healers. Amen. I, what I doubt and what I criticize against is some person who just touches or does the healing themselves. Yeah. I don't believe in that. I don't believe that, like the apostles back then, if a person is sick, that, okay, I touch you and you're healed. I don't believe in that. That was back in the days of the apostles where God was operating with the nation of Israel. Today, that is no longer available. If a lot of you uh, have questions about that, just watch my video, How to Witness to Charismatics. How to Witness to Charismatics, because I'm not going to explain it in this video. But aside from all that, we see over here that I do not believe in that. That one is actually where you're trusting and believing in the right religion, the right belief, because you see somebody doing the miracle. That one is a sign of the Antichrist. Yeah. So if you say Christians are getting into that just because of what you're seeing in miracles, the Antichrist can... Because you got to realize that this verse shows right here that the Antichrist is working miracles. And he's not going to say, I'm the devil, I do miracles and then fool you like that. No. What he's going to do is that he calls himself Jesus Christ. It is going to be so, something totally Christian in your eyes. And because it's going to look so Christian in your eyes, you're going to accept that Jesus and believe in that Jesus. So you better watch out for that. That is some, the Antichrist, what, he, what is he trying to do? He's imitating Jesus Christ. So because he's going to imitate Jesus Christ, some of you say, well, I received this vision that I saw Jesus Christ, and because of that, I cast off uh, my lost belief and I became a saved believer. There are some people who actually say that. Now, there are two things you have to examine yourself, okay, which is very, very something you have to take careful on. The Bible says that when we're saved by faith, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? Word of God. Word of God. The Word of God is what gives us the born again nature. Not visions, Amen. not what we experience. So if the basis of your salvation was 
because of that vision, that experience, then you better examine your salvation because salvation is based off of the Word of God. Now, some of you might say, well, I really think that I did believe. I know that it was not by works. It was just by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, if you really believe that, my question to you is this, okay? If that vision, because you rely a lot on that vision. If that vision never happened, I wouldn't have gotten saved. Ah, okay, then here's the question. If God never sent that vision to you, would you have gotten saved? If someone showed you from the word of God how to get saved, would you get saved? Or is it because, only because of that vision, if that vision never happened, you would not have become a Christian? See, that's something to check your heart then. So then is your salvation based on the word of God, or is it something that you experienced? That's something you got to examine yourself. The second thing is this. The second thing is, is that, look, I'm not accusing everyone who saw Jesus in a vision that, uh, oh, they're lost, they're burning in hell. No, it may be possible that you may have truly believed in Jesus by faith, not by the works of the law, and that you're a saved person. That's not an excuse where you justify visions. You might say, why? Because there are people who's been shown, for example, there were people who were... NIV believers and who believe in modern versions. And guess what? Just because that they heard the NIV being preached to them or other people ministering to them and other preachers who minister to them, you might be surprised, a lot of them, they're not Bible-believing Christians and they're not in right doctrine. They're in wrong doctrine. So let's just say this person got saved by an NIV, by a pastor who didn't believe in right doctrine. Does that justify their beliefs to be right? No. What matters is salvation. Not on this guy over here on whatever do wrong doctrine he teaches or the NIV. That doesn't legitimize the NIV. That doesn't legitimize that person's wrong doctrine. That's the same thing with your visions, okay? So what that you believed in Jesus Christ for salvation? That doesn't legitimize your vision. That's the problem with a lot of people. I can give you testimonies of people who listen to that uh, demonic music, contemporary music, and when they heard that music and then they got into the Holy Spirit and the person gave the gospel, the person got saved. Mm -hmm. Does that legitimize that contemporary rock music? No, it doesn't. It does not. See, that's the problem with people. It doesn't legitimize those things. So listen, the Antichrist is using this to sway people. Because look, if that's your excuse that this legit, what legitimizes my vision to be true is because that's uh, what legitimizes my vision is because I experienced it. That's why I became a saved Christian. Then how is that going to work with a Catholic who went through visions? How about that? Do you know Catholics talk about the apparitions and the visions they saw? Does that legitimize their vision? Do you know that there are so many different religions out there that talk about, I saw a vision of this, I saw a vision of that? Yeah. So how can we tell who's right and who's wrong? See that? By the way, another thing is this. Sometimes you got to question yourself if you really saw the right vision, and then the easy question to ask is, what did Jesus look like? Ah, yeah, that's good. And then you're going to hear different accounts from different people of what Jesus looked like then I would like to ask you this. Can you really believe that's a true Jesus then? See, so you got to watch out for that kind of stuff. Now, I know a lot of people just got angry at me just now, and I hope that you're not seeing me as a person who's just... People keep calling me arrogant and putting them down. No, the reason why I'm telling you all this is because, look, I care for you that I don't want you to get deceived by wrong teachings and wrong practices. Otherwise, I wouldn't even say this to you. Amen. If, I, if I really didn't care for you, I would not even talk about this uncomfortable subject and keep you as my viewer and my subscriber. Amen. Okay, enough of that. So be careful of that experience thing because that's how the Antichrist will use it to deceive people right. is experience. You know, experience is something very dangerous and something very powerful. You know that? You might say, why? Because there's a lot of um, scientists who are atheists. But the reason why they're willing to open up to the religious realm is because some kind of existential moment or experience that they went through. So the experience is so strong and powerful 
That's why they allow that. And see, the Antichrist sees that, and Satan's going to use that same emotion that they're sensing and feeling to suck them into his side. If you look at 2 Thessalonians 2, it's very scary. God says that because they receive not the love of the truth, like right now, you don't like hearing this because it's truth, the word of truth, because they receive not the love of the truth, but had pleasure, see how you feel, in unrighteousness. See, you have pleasure in that. So the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse uh, 8 through 12, just read that passage. The Antichrist uses those lying signs and wonders to appeal to the people's experience, their pleasure to suck them in. That's right. And guess what? He's going to appear like what you saw in your vision of Jesus. You better watch out for that. That's good teaching. But it doesn't explain how I got saved or I even got led to your channel because of this vision, etc. Guess what? It doesn't legitimize it just like an NIV, just like contemporary music. Look, God even used wicked people to accomplish his purpose. Yeah. It doesn't justify those wicked things, though. Nebuchadnezzar, you know what he was doing? <clears throat> he was slaughtering babies and killing a bunch of people. The Lord did it for that. Did that justify Nebuchadnezzar's action? Oh, so I can keep killing babies? No, sir. It doesn't. It doesn't. All right, let's keep reading at verse 14. They are the spirits of devil working miracles, which go forth... So these spirits, these demonic spirits are sent out and they do miracles so they can deceive the whole world, which go forth the kings of the earth and of the whole world. So these demonic spirits, they start to spread out now around the world. So they're spreading around all over the world, trying to gather up a bunch of people of the kings all over the world, kings all over the world. So United Nations, you see that? Yes. United Nations. Why? Keep reading over there. They're going to battle against God. To gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So he's, these devils are gathering these kings all over the world to what? The, to battle against the great day of God Almighty. They're going to war against God. Now, what does this mean? The, the great day of God Almighty. Now, this is very important because this phrase occurs very much often. I could be wrong, but when you, uh, when you look at the day, this particular day, it's mentioned more than the word saved oh, yeah. or grace or faith. Now, I could be wrong about that, but this is all over your Bible. In all dispensations, pretty much, you're going to see this. This is very, that's why the theme in your Bible is not salvation by faith. It's actually the second coming of Christ. You're going to see that all over your Bible. The day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. So it comes in different ways. In this one, it calls it uh, battle of that great day of God Almighty. So let's look at many passages. There are too many passages we're going to look at a couple, and then I'm going to list some. Look at Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Now, out of everything you learn today, this is something that you want to learn the most because this is the main theme throughout your Bible. This is the main theme throughout your Bible is the second coming of Christ where God gets back what rightfully belongs to him and he conquers evil. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. Notice over here, <clears throat> for the what? Day. day of the Lord of hosts shall it be upon everyone that is proud and lofty. See, the wicked people, God's going to battle them. And upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. See, God conquers them. That directly matches with Revelation 16. See, that particular day. All right, let's look at many other parts. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 46 and verse 10. Look at this. You'll notice this all matches up with Revelation 16. This all matches up with Revelation 16. Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 10. For this is the day 
of the Lord God of hosts. A day of vengeance. So it's also called day of vengeance. That why? He may avenge him of his adversaries. See, the enemies who conquer, who try to conquer him. And the sword shall devour, and it shall be... Your God is a bloody God, you got to realize. I mean, he saved you by his blood, yes, and he's going to conquer and kill by blood. Whether he saves, uh, I'll tell you what, all right? I want to get under the good side of his blood, not the bad side. Let's look at, let's keep reading. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice. He calls it a sacrifice in the north country by where? By the river Euphrates. Remember Revelation 16? When they're gathering all the kings of the earth, yeah. when you, uh, they're gathering to which river? The river Euphrates. Remember that? That was found at Revelation 16, 12. See, there is no doubt this is all prophecy here. Amen. This is all prophecy here. Let's look at other verses. We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel 13, and then we'll read verse 5. Ezekiel chapter 13, and then we'll read verse 5. Notice over here, the day, the date. Now, let me give you some good advice, okay? There are so many different ways God calls us in the Bible, but I would like to tell you one thing. Pay attention when he says the day. Now, take it for granted, uh, you know, you don't want to be too crazy that where whenever it mentions day, it means Armageddon, okay? Obviously not, but you can tell by context. When you look at the context of the passage, it's like God's talking about something future or people, they're expecting something to happen in the future. When you feel that kind of vibe in the context and you see them call it the day, there's a very good chance that's referring to that Armageddon, that second coming. There's a very good chance of that. So pay attention to that. Pay attention to that term in your Bible. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 5. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel, to stand in the battle in the what? Day of the Lord. See, day of the Lord is all referring to that battle, that warfare that involves Israel. Because this is by the river where? Euphrates. They're going to, to Israel. They're all gathering up at Israel. Let's look at, oh my, there is a galore of verses. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1. This will be the last one. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1. Now, while you're turning over there, I'm going to give you all the other verses, and I'm going to go through it. I'm just only going to call out these verses one time, though, okay? I'm only going to say it once. Once this video is archive video, you can have the freedom to rewind. The verses include Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6, and verse 9. Ezekiel chapter 30, and verse 3. Joel chapter 1, and verse 15, chapter 2, and verse 1, and verse 11, and verse 31, Joel chapter 3, verse 14, Amos chapter 5, verse 18, and verse 20, Obadiah, verse 15, Zephaniah chapter 1, and verse 7, and verse 14, Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5. You want me to give you more? There's way more. This is definitely the theme throughout your whole Bible. All right, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather what? All, All nations against Jerusalem to battle. Now, remember what your pastor said? The Lord can use something evil to accomplish his purpose, right? So when people talk about miracles and visions, how can that be demonic? Well, this is a great example. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. These devils are using miracles to what? Gather up the nations. 
But what did God say at Zechariah 14, verse 1 and 2? I'm doing that to gather the nations. See, be careful of that. Be careful of that. Just because you might say, well, I don't understand. You know, this seems like something God would do. Well, God would use the, the devil to accomplish his purpose. That doesn't make it not demonic. So uh, we see Zechariah 14. This is definitely United Nations. We see that. United Nations. It says nations, nations, nations. So this is undoubtedly talking about United Nations. Now remember, your pastor mentioned in last Revelation study that the Antichrist, that he's going to stomp out uh, what's going on in the East and get the people of the East to join his side. So the people of the East... They're going to join the United Nations, and they're all going to cram against Israel. Now, there's no doubt Israel is going to be wiped out, that they have a losing chance, and that's why they need that Messiah to save them later on. 